So there's one improper integral yet to be discussed. And that's integrals that look like this. And we'll no problem, it's nasty out there. We'll um we'll talk once we've talked about this, we'll have talked about all the types of improper integrals. Um, and then we can look talk about applications of it all. Um so the problem here, of course, is that you know, there's a problem at the beginning and at the end of the integral. Like when we were looking at um, asymptotes. We looked at integrals where there was a problem at the beginning or a problem at the end. But we've never looked at an integral like this for the beginning and the end are giving us issues. Um, nevertheless, this is pretty similar to something we've done before. When we were talking about vertical asymptotes, if we had a vertical asymptote inside the integral, we made the observation, well, we can cut, we can cut the integral up. And now we just have an issue at the first limit and we have an issue at the second limit, one issue per integral as it were. And we can take both of those individual integrals, or in that particular case, we can see that the individual integrals don't exist. So it's a similar trick here. Um, in this example, I erased it just before I needed to talk about it again. But in this example, there was a specific value you used to break the integral up. The zero inside of the interior of the integral. Here, there's no number inside here that's uh, that's particularly important. F of X needs to be defined everywhere if we're going to talk about an integral that looks like this. But we can pick a number, any number, like a magician. Um, pick a card, pick any number, and then we can use that number we pick to break this improper integral into two improper integrals. So similar, but not quite identical to what we're doing with asymptotes, with vertical asymptotes, I should say. Um, giving examples with this is a whole lot harder than giving examples um, in the previous cases. And that's because these integrals only tend to exist when we have a very complicated looking function. That's like, let's see if I can <laughs> go to Desmos. 
assume, giving me a bit of trouble here. Let me see if we can go to Desmos and let's see, the classic example would be something like that, e to the negative x squared. We'll talk about a slightly more complicated version of this example that has a few constants floating around, probably Thursday. I mean, if you have any background in probability, you might recognize this as a bell curve, essentially. So here's a very famous and very important important example where this integral does exist. Um, we do not have any tools that will allow us to integral integrate e to the negative x squared dx by hand, though. <laughs> And actually, this is um, kind of complicated, even if you're not doing stuff by hand, because you can't use like the trapezoidal rule to integrate this. There would be an infinite number of trapezoids. Um, we won't talk about the details, but this is something we normally numerically estimate. And I mean, I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, the details are that this integral is so important that things like MATLAB and Mathematica have tables of data stored inside them, telling you what these integrals are. But, <laughs> At least in theory, we can say now oh, this is the integral from negative infinity to zero of e to the negative x squared plus the integral from zero to infinity e to the negative x squared Yes. But there's nothing special about that zero. I could scribble this out and integrate from negative infinity to five, and then from five to positive infinity. The only essential fact is that those integrals the upper limit of the first integral and the lower limit of the second integral match. So let's go ahead and let's just, well, Sometimes there's really nothing for it. Zero of e to the negative x squared. So this is, this is crazy, the square root of pi over two, that's such an exact so I and I confess that I'm not quite sure where it comes from. Earth is the error function. We're going to talk about that probably Thursday a little, but it's about 0.886. Let me 
And this graph is perfectly symmetric around the y axis. So the integral from zero to infinity is also going to be about 0 0.886. So to find the integral, you just add those up. Although, of course, in reality, once you've pulled your computer algebra system up, there's really no need to be doing this, because if Wolfram Alpha can go from zero to infinity, and it can go from negative infinity to infinity, I think you need to make the first infinity negative. You are exactly correct. Although it really ought, I think, to be spitting back an error message. I don't think the integral from infinity to infinity is defined, but um, there about 1.772, which making allowances for rounding. Or actually, I don't think you have to make allowances for rounding. I think this is just what you get exactly if you add those together. Six and six is 12, eight and eight is 16, and yep, that's exactly correct. So we'll talk about integrals that look like this. Um, um, giving me a pop-up right in front of the next uh, slide button. So we'll talk about where integrals like this come into play Wednesday and Thursday when we dip into probability for a bit. Incidentally, um, you do, I mean, I know, um, I know there's a tendency to sort of learn stuff and then forget it, but Mr. Saloon's probability class, if any of you need that, does require integration and calculus. Um, and I only mention that because I've, ha I've had students go in there and then uh, not retain this material. Where was I? Yeah, I was saying we'll put that off until tomorrow. I mean, the fundamental application of a, a limit that infinity is based around the net change theorem. And the net change theorem is doing a thing again. Sorry about the kind of janky handwriting. The net change theorem is just the fundamental theorem of calculus reframed a little. So what this says is this f of b minus f of a is the amount that this function changes on an interval from a to b. So if you want to know how much something is changing, that's a calculus problem, and it's done using integration. And I think this sometimes feels backwards to students, like the idea that you would know f prime of x, but not know f of x, 
but that happens in a lot of situations. It's very frequently easier to measure how something is changing than it is to measure the actual quantity. Like, it's very easy to put down sensors and get information about a river's current, but trying to find a function that will model the river is extremely difficult. In fact, it's an unsolved problem, the Stokes-Navier equations. So it's very often true that you know the derivative, but not the original function. And you can then use calculus to see how the function changes over an interval. So for example, let's say you are a government inspector And it's your job to try to maintain environmental regulations. So there's a pollutant seeping into the soil. And again, this is a situation where it's very easy to get you know, basic information about how the rate of the pollutant in the soil is changing. You just look how much there is the first day, you look how much there is the second day, you look how much there is the third day, or you could use more sophisticated techniques. But getting some idea of what the derivative looks like is pretty straightforward. And if you then want to know how much pollutant total will see into the soil over the course of one year. Well, it all depends on what X is being measured in. But if X is being measured in days, is, let's say, and we call today day zero, then the answer to this problem is found using the net change theorem which is really, again, the fundamental theorem of calculus in a way. Um, we integrate the rate of change, and that will tell us how much pollutant there was at the end of the year, minus how much pollutant there was at the beginning of the year, which is the amount of the which is the amount that the pollutant will seep into the soil over the course of a year. Well, what you often want to ask is less questions like this and more questions like how much pollutant will seep into the soil if nothing is done? to halt this seepage. And now you're in kind of a weird situation, or at least a different situation. You want to know how much pollutant will seep into the soil, but you're no longer given an upper value to you. 
So we're not being asked what happens in a year or in five years or in a decade. You're just being kind of generically asked what will happen in the future. And in situations like this, we usually think of that as an integral going to infinity. And we do understand that, that this isn't quite true. I mean, that, that after like a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000 years, the factory or whatever it is will be gone and no more seepage is happening. But we can't predict the future and we don't know how many years it will take for that to happen. So if we want to talk sort of generically about the future, we usually do it with an infinity symbol. And this, going back to something I said yesterday, this is why integrals from A to infinity are really common. But integrals from negative infinity to B are not. I mean, the integral from negative infinity to B is the total amount f of x changed and no longer talking about the future. We're now asking how much something changed in the past. From negative infinity to now, assuming that B is now. And there are a lot fewer situations where we're interested in asking a question like this, like using our pollutant example. Let's say this is seeping out of a factory. The reason we're using infinity instead of how long the factory is going to be there or how long it will take the factory to implement regulations that stop this is that we don't know those times. We can't use those as upper bounds because we don't know them. On the other hand, we presumably know when this factory was built. So if we want to know how much pollutant has seeped into the soil in the past, there's not really any cause for an improper integral, we can just integrate from when the factory was built to now. So, I mean, sometimes like in archeology span or anthropology, sort of looking at people who are looking at very long scales of time, you might see applications like this, but it's, like this, I say, I erased it, but you might see applications that look like this. But as I say, it's much less common. So let's give another application and it will be another A to infinity or zero to infinity application. 
Um, I like this application. I mean, I like every application that is me actually taking examples from other disciplines instead of sort of making functions up. So this is from Merck's Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, although it's in other places as well. Let's talk about the bioavailability of a drug. Let's say we have a drug and it can be administered two ways. It can be administered orally as a pill. or it can be administered intravenously via injection. And administering a drug intravenously is better in the sense that there's less waste because you can administer the drug exactly where it needs to be. I mean, you have somebody who's been bitten by a dog and does not have a rabies vaccine, the drug can be administered directly to the site of the bite. Whereas if a drug's administered orally, it has to pass, you know, through the liver and through the cell walls, and your body doesn't know the drug's helping it. It just thinks of the drug as an impurity that it wants to get rid of. So some of the drug is lost. So in that sense, administering drugs intravenously is better. Um, but of course, from a sort of human standpoint and a practical standpoint, very few of us want to administer a drug to ourselves via a needle. I mean, of course, some people have to. Diabetes would be the main example, but it's a hard thing for most people to do. So... Let's say this is easier, is how we'll phrase it. Most people would rather take a pill than inject themselves with a drug. So the question you ask is, well, if you administer a drug orally, there is some waste, like one cc of a drug taken orally is less effective than one cc of a drug administered intravenously. Um, but how much less effective is it? I mean, if it's, you know, if it's only if it's ninety percent as effective, that's probably fine. You know, you waste ten percent of the drug. It's not ideal, but it's something most of us would probably be willing to live with if the alternative were using a hypodermic needle. So the bioavailability. Yeah? of a drug is a measurement of how effective the drug is when it's administered 
worthy versus when it's administered intravenous. So a bioavailability of zero point three, for example, would mean it's thirty percent as effective. <laughs> So in general, if you want to make a comparison like that, you do division. Like bringing this back to the classroom, if you want to know how you did on your test, you look at the score you got divided by the best score it was possible to get, the number of points on the test. And this is basically what we're doing here. Instead of having a score you got and the best possible score, you have the drug effect that you get orally. And then because administering a drug intravenously is optimal <clears throat> in terms of reducing waste, you can think of it as being the best possible effect from the drug. <clears throat> so how should we measure that? It would be should be something divided by something else. And now let's go back and remember an example we did when we were talking about the trapezoidal rule. And I said, that the integral, of the concentration of a drug in a patient's bloodstream from A to B is the patient's total exposure to the drug. And we're going to use total exposure as a, I'm blanking on the technical word, a benchmark. We're going to use total exposure as a way of measuring how effective the drug is. We're going to assume that the more exposure there is of, to the drug, the more effectiveness there is. Gosh, what a sentence that was. Um, but yeah, we're going to assume that high exposure means high effectiveness and low exposure means low effectiveness. So we'll define C sub O of T. the concentration after T hours when the drug is administered orally. And we'll define C sub I of T to be concentration after T hours when the drug is administered intravenously. 
So what's the bio of L the Billy? Yeah. Well, we've said that we're using exposure to the drug to measure its effectiveness. And we've said that exposure is the integral of the concentration. So it's one integral divided by another integral. An integral from what to what? Well, if t is the number of hours since the drug was administered, then we're starting at t equals zero. And then some upper bound. And we don't, the issue is we're talking very generically about a drug here, but different drugs are going to remain in a patient's bloodstream for radically different amounts of time. So it doesn't really make sense to say we want to ask what happens after specifically 24 hours or specifically 48 hours. We want to just sort of ask generically, well, what happens in the future? Between the time this patient is administered this drug and the time the patient is well again. What's happening? And then we want to talk sort of generically about the future. That's when we use these integral signs. So the bioavailability of a drug is defined in terms of two improper integrals. And that brings us to the end of this material. We will we will lecture. Um, let me pause the recording. <laughs>